privilege and honor at this point to introduce Mr. James Franco. Let's give him a warm Picoderm welcome. I'm going to start by taking you back 113 years. Uh, my grandfather was three years old. Uh, he leaves what is now Slovenia uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and gets on a boat in France and comes to the United States um, as a three-year-old. This is my grandfather. It's not my great-grandfather. I can do math. I assure you I've met the man. Um, and uh, then 38 years later, my dad is born right after World War II. He's the first gentleman uh, or member of his family, excuse me, to go to college. That's probably a similar story to what many of you all have in your families, right? Where somebody comes from Europe a few generations ago, the first generation of college folks, um, and it's about the opportunity that they came to here in the United States and the opportunity that I now have to speak to you today as a schmuck lobbyist who works for some think tank, um, even though... Uh, I've now worked at a couple of different think tanks, and I don't know that I can actually describe in any real detail um, what it is that we do, but I'm going to try to talk about that today a little bit as it relates to the opportunities uh, that exist here at the state level and what KPI's role in kind of creating those opportunities might be. Uh, but before I do so, uh, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much uh, to Jennifer and Carl. Um, I moved to, I'm from Kansas, I grew up in the Kansas City area, so you'll forgive me for being a Johnson County kid. Um, but then moved to Wichita in the summer of uh, 2010, I believe it was, and have been uh, a longtime visitor of the Pachyderm Club and have been uh, granted the opportunity to speak here a few times back when John Todd was running the show and now it's gone on to uh, better hands and Carl and Jennifer and, and other folks. So uh, yeah, John, you're clapping, right? So uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, thank you very much to the Petroleum Club itself. They always take great care of us uh, whenever um, I've been here. And then uh, we mentioned, you know, my long time have been at KPI for 13 years, but uh, we were founded in 1996, uh, back when think tanks published a lot of white papers that nobody uh, read. And a lot of those white papers sat in the office or the storage facility of Martin Eby, who was one of our founding board members. Uh, who's been a longtime Packeter member and, and guest as well. So thank you to Martin. I look out uh, across the room and see lots of other supporters in different ways, be it supporting KPI's work, you know, financially with their time and talent and treasure, a lot of champions for the issues that KPI talks about in the legislature as well. So if I can't answer a question on something, I will point to Senator Erickson or Representative Owens on forfeiture or whatnot, and we'll let them answer the hard questions. Um, but if you look at KPI's work, oftentimes what we'll hear about or what you'll see um, is what amounts to a really nice spreadsheet. Um, it's almost like you're being vomited on with a lot of data. And that undergirds everything that we do. Because as Carl said, you have part-time legislators who are up in Topeka, which is where we spend most of our time. Um, and it's hard for them to get good, accurate information. The only places that they can really go oftentimes are to the bureaucracy to the school districts themselves, what have you. So a lot of KPI's work is about providing unvarnished data. So if you go to kansaspolicy.org, you see one of our posts on Twitter or Facebook or something like that, and you say, hey, we're, KPI says we're spending nearly $20,000 per kid on education or whatnot. That's actually not our information. We sleuth through it a lot, but we're just publishing what the State Department of Education publishes. So if, you, if somebody says, well, that's KPI's information, you can't trust it. On every single thing that we post down at the bottom, it's going to say, here's where we got that information. And we're just putting it in a hopefully a more useful uh, means for people to actually use it themselves. But I want to back up a step and talk about today and talk about what kind of belay, you know, undergirds all of that, which is about opportunity. And it's about trusting individuals to make better decisions than people in government. So we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about educational opportunity. We're going to talk about economic opportunity. And then I want to close by talking about kind of some personal liberty and regulatory opportunity as well. So going back to the kind of the Franco family story, my family ultimately settled in the Kansas City area. My parents lived in Kansas City, Missouri. And when it was time for my brothers and I to go to school, they moved across state line into Johnson County because they wanted to go to the good Blue Valley public schools. This was back in the 1970s. And we are living proof of what most everybody in this room knows. We have school choice in Kansas for the people who can afford it. 
But there are people who live within a mile of where we stand right now who don't have the means to either move to a better public school district or to afford a private school or to homeschool or do any of these different kinds of things. And a lot of KPI's work is trying to drive choice in education. In 20... And the reason why, again, the numbers that undergird this, low-income kids are two to three grade levels behind their higher-income peers. Even as a state, even those higher-income folks, um, a lot of uh, those students, their achievement has been flat over the last 20 years. This predates the pandemic. It predates No Child Left Behind. On one hand, it's not necessarily much different than what a lot of other states experience as well. My mom was a public school teacher. I am a public school grad, whether they're proud to have me or not. Um, and lots of kids, I'm sure if we did a show of hands here, you would be able to say, my daughter was a public school teacher, I was a public school teacher, my kids. Lots of kids get an excellent education in our Kansas public schools, but it doesn't work for everybody. There's approximately 50,000 students in the Wichita Public School District, and it just beggars belief to think that that one system would serve each of those kids equally well. Right, I have three kids. Uh, we homeschool them, we have since before the pandemic. Uh, our oldest is a wonderful reader and is just merely average at math. Our nine-year-old is almost caught up with his brother on math but struggles to read a little bit. And it is because we can slow down and we can adapt to the different experiences that they need, the different opportunities that they need to be able to speak to them where they are, not force them into a class even at a high-performing private school or something like that and make them move along with a group of 20 or 25 or 30 kids. So when KPI talks about opportunity, or we talk about driving student achievement, or with our new Kansas School Board Resource Center empowering local boards of education to make better decisions, it's not about the $20,000 per kid. It is about an opportunity for each and every one of those children to be able to find the right educational opportunity. And doing so in a way that prevents you know, the uh, shackles with coming with the shekels, so to speak, which is something that we hear a lot when we talk about school choice, is that if you have an education savings account or a refundable income tax credit like they have in Oklahoma or the existing tax credit scholarship program that we have here in Kansas, that with that money is going to come government regulation. And that is a real fear, and it's something that we guard against every single time. When we were talking about education savings accounts with Senator Erickson and Representative Christy Williams this year, you know, we went with a belt and suspenders approach to make sure that we were doing everything that we possibly could to make sure that that government money did not erode what private or home or micro schools were able to do. Because they don't need government to tell them how to educate the kids. More kids just need the opportunity to attend their schools. We passed an education savings account bill through the House this year with 65 votes and it failed in the Senate for the second year in a row so you can throw things at Senator Erickson uh, for not being able to deliver more of her colleagues. Uh, she was one of the yes votes on that so don't throw things at her for her vote. Uh, throw things at her for not being more persuasive with her colleagues. Um, uh, come on. Um, but we can look back over the last 10 years and say um, incidentally it was some uh, people who claim to support school choice who actually ultimately voted against that. It wasn't just folks who say all we need to do is give the public schools more money and the rest of it will take care of itself. Um, it is folks who ostensibly are talking about these same kinds of things but when push actually comes to shove they don't vote for it. And those are the kind of things if you've seen our freedom index that we try to elucidate a little bit. There are now 10 states uh, that have universal school choice. And Kansas, frankly, probably won't be the next one to do it. The Wall Street Journal, a lot of other groups have said that 2023 has been the year of school choice, but we're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. And as long as we have folks like you who are helping us talk about these things, who are helping us drive uh, the idea that we should be focused on student opportunity, not dollars and cents, we will get there at some point. But right now we've got a governor and a good number of legislators who don't actually support it. So, Oklahoma was one of them just this year. Arkansas, Iowa, three, or excuse me, uh, yeah, three of our neighbors have passed what amount to universal school choice programs over just the last couple of months. And it's a question of who gets to decide what's right for each kid. Is it their zip code or is it their parents? Because not everybody can afford to move to a different zip code to attend the school that they want to. 
And like I said, we spent about $20,000 per kid all in between the state, local, and the feds on education, and that's not getting us nearly enough. What we do get from a lot of it is arguments about what's being taught, how it's being taught, all of those things, which are important. But they would be less important if each and every kid could take $5,000, $7,500 from the state portion of their money and attend the private school that they wanted or attend the public school that they wanted. And a lot of those questions would be asked for answered for themselves. Excuse me. You had, I believe it was just a couple of months ago, uh, Delina Wallace was here talking about micro schools and hybrid education. These things that are kind of on the cutting edge of education reform movement. So it's not just school of choice. It's what can be done even outside of that kind of a debate to uh, ultimately deliver a high performing education to every kid, including in public schools. Right? The overwhelming majority of kids in, in Kansas or any other state are always going to be educated in public schools. So we're going to make sure those are as high performing as we possibly can. So if you are a Board of Education member, if you know somebody who is a Board of Education member, um, have them get in touch with us. Just earlier this year, we started the Kansas School Board Resource Center uh, that serves as essentially a clearinghouse and a mutual aid society for members on boards of education around the state so that they can adopt good policies that maybe what works in Wichita could work in Andover or Goodland or Johnson County or anywhere else. Um, so have those folks get in touch with us. Um, and everybody in this room, I would assume, knows about Urban Preparatory Academy, right? There's a young lady named Elena who goes to school there. Actually, uh, she's probably now since graduated. She started there early on because of the tax credit scholarship program that came into law in 2014. And to hear her and her family talk about how she dreaded going to school before and how she's now has this opportunity where she's the one saying, Dad, come on, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go, I got to get to school. And that is exactly what we should be encouraging more and more kids to have the opportunity to do this. Changing to economic uh, opportunity a little bit, I want you to remember one number, and it is how much Kansas is projected to have in the bank at the end of the year, or excuse me, at the end of the upcoming fiscal year. And that is $3 billion. $3 billion. Now, that's a lot of money to you and me or even to government. But that's how much the state is sitting on. And the question is, what are we going to do with it? Now, again, it's not about the dollars and cents. It's about what the dollars represent. And what those dollars represent is opportunity for each and every person in this room, for the people working here at the Petroleum Club or anywhere else, to be able to keep a little bit more about what it is or what they earn. There was a uh, move to a flat tax proposal that was vetoed by Governor Laura Kelly last year. And again, it was some people who talk about lowering taxes who, when it came time to actually override that veto, um, did not vote to override that veto. They voted with Governor Laura Kelly to keep more of that money in the coffers of government. And it is about jobs. It is about opportunity. The states that have the lowest uh, taxes in, this, in the country far outperform every other state when it comes to private sector job growth. And back during the pandemic, we would talk about, you know, essential jobs and what counted and what didn't, you know, and who was going to get to stay open. An essential job is one that gives somebody a paycheck. And that paycheck is essential to that family. It doesn't mean that I know how to spend that money. I barely know how to balance my own checkbook at this point, right? But it is about our family making those decisions for ourselves. So if we want to save a little bit more, if we want to pay down some debt, if we want to take the kids to a wing nuts game, whatever it is, we are better able to make those decisions. We're better able to invest that money in our family however we want. I believe Arthur Brooks has spoken here before. It's been years. Um, but he talked about the idea of earned success. It's not enough just to give somebody a lottery ticket, a winning lottery ticket at that, I should say, and say, hey, go out and have a good, fruitful life. It's about giving each person the opportunity to go out and define the American dream for themselves. And lowering taxes is going to make that a little bit easier because it's going to allow them to keep a little bit more money in their pocket at the end of each month. And this is you know, an important lesson to take uh, from roughly a decade ago when we cut taxes under you know, kind of the quote unquote brownback era tax cuts and this great experiment that was going to be a shot of adrenaline into the Kansas economy. And the simple truth to that, it's something that KPI talks a lot about, is that you can't cut taxes and raise spending. We can't do that in our homes. The Petroleum Club can't do that as they're trying you know, to make a business work. Entrepreneurs can't do that. 
and we shouldn't expect government to be able to do that as well. Now, some of that was driven by a state Supreme Court decision on education, but the simple, unavoidable truth is that despite the best efforts of lots of friends uh, in and around the legislature and the governor's office, we cut taxes and raised spending. And that just doesn't work for the same reason, you know, that two plus two doesn't equal five. And it's about creating opportunities for that next generation to stay here to live to work so that my kids, so that your kids and grandkids don't have to move to Oklahoma or Texas or somewhere else to be able to provide for their jobs and to have their, their kids and future generations. And the funny thing is, is that Laura Kelly seemingly understands this. She likes giving tax cuts. She just wants to give them to the people that she likes. So that's why you see a lot of uh, corporate subsidies going to folks like Panasonic up in Johnson County or Integra down here. It doesn't mean that those aren't good companies. It doesn't mean that the people who are working there aren't going to be an important part of Kansas. But at the same time that we are essentially cutting the taxes for those folks with some kind of a subsidy, we're keeping taxes higher on everybody else in this room. So coming up in this next legislative session, we're gonna be talking a lot about the need to cut taxes again, because we do have those $3 billion worth of reserves sitting there. We can afford these tax cuts now and then with even just a little bit of fiscal discipline, be able to afford them well into the future as well. Talking a little bit about, uh, I think Carl mentioned uh, the Kansas Justice Institute uh, in the introduction. And who here likes the First Amendment? Right, this is the interactive part, raise your hands. Everybody raise your hands, okay? Um, but then there's, and we think about, when we think about constitutional questions, we think about the federal constitution. But it's also important to think about the state constitution and what protections are afforded in that document as well. We shouldn't just always look to the U.S. Constitution, that U.S. Charter of Liberty, to be able to um, protect our rights. There are rights that exist here at the state level as well, and we should be doing that. So everybody in this room agrees with the idea that government shouldn't get to tell you what you can say and where you can say it. Government shouldn't get to tell you that you need a permission slip in order to pursue lawful employment, to earn an honest living. The government shouldn't be able to claim your property even though you've never been convicted of a crime. Right? These are the things that the Kansas Justice Institute talks about. We started the Kansas Justice Institute uh, in 2019, I believe it was, and our first client were a group or were a family of raw milk producers out in Pfeiffer, Kansas. And I won't ask anybody to raise their hand if they've actually ever been to Pfeiffer, because uh, you're lying, you haven't. Um, uh, neither has anybody, <laughs> I'm joking, sir. Um, uh, they have a beautiful church there. Uh, it's in Ellis County, it's just outside of Hayes. Up until that point, it was illegal for them to talk about the raw milk that their goats produced off of their farm. They couldn't put it on Facebook, they couldn't go to a 4-H meeting and show their goats and then somebody say, hey, what do you do with the milk? They could not answer that question. They couldn't do one of those pull tab things and put it in a church bulletin or anything like that. Government said you were not allowed to talk about raw milk off of the farm where it was produced. No advertising, no nothing. And the only place you could do sales was still on the farm. So Mark and Coraline Bunner, they were the intrepid folks who took kind of a bet on Kansas Justice Institute. We represented them excuse me, and then over the ensuing months reached a uh, consent agreement with the Attorney General's office and then had to spend years cleaning it up with the legislature in order to make it legal to be able to talk about a perfectly legal product. We are making First Amendment claims. Government doesn't get to tell you what you can say and where you can say it. And it doesn't mean if that is political speech or commercial speech, it's just speech. And then when we talk about the state constitution, there's this idea um, that you have a right to earn an honest living. And I want to tell you two quick stories, and then we'll get into Q&A, because that's more fun for me anyway. Uh, another one of our clients were a group of uh, an immigrant family from India um, who do eyebrow threading. All right. So this is trimming up your eyebrow with a piece of cotton thread, you know, so that we all look well-groomed and well-kept. No scissors, no chemicals, no nothing. It is using a piece of cotton thread to shape your eyebrow. Up until we got involved, eyebrow threaders in Kansas had to spend upwards of 
15 or $20,000 to get a license and go to about 1,000 hours of education to learn something that wasn't taught in most of our cosmetology schools in the state of Kansas. So we joined with the Modi family up in Johnson County and represented them uh, in an action against the Board of Cosmetology. You don't need a permission slip from government to be able to shape somebody's eyebrow with a piece of cotton thread. And then just this week, we wrapped up a case where um, Ellen Finnerty is a resident of Ottawa, Kansas, and she sued again with the Kansas Justice Institute, the city of Ottawa, because they had a beekeeping ordinance that made it functionally illegal to keep bees in your backyard. They had a home-based business ban that made it illegal for her to sell any produce, honey, fruit, whatever, at the local farmer's market from her home. So we sued the city of um, Ottawa on her behalf, and thankfully the city understood the stakes of what we were talking about in making those same kind of right to earn an honest living claims, and they changed their ordinance. So it doesn't just work with suing and getting a court judgment, although that is ultimately important as we're trying to establish precedent, but it's about finding victories for each and every one of these people around the state. And it could be something as mundane as that, but it's ultimately about driving at these larger constitutional principles, be it property rights or anything else. So when the city of Wichita says, hey, we're going to tell you what you can't do with your property and we're not going to let you rent your property or something like that, that's something we want to have an interest in. Right, so uh, when the city just passed their, I, I cannot remember what the, the name of it is at this point, what ordinance it was, but talking about short-term rentals with Airbnb or Verbo or something like that, I understand the concerns that many citizens have of what that looks like, but government doesn't get to tell you what you can do with your property. Um, and that's where Kansas Justice Institute ultimately steps in and tries to protect the constitutional rights of different folks. And as I think back over what, excuse me, these three things mean, and then, you know, kind of the Franco family story, or at least as I've uh, told it here, it's about the opportunities that exist in America that do not exist in any other country. Just as we were talking a little bit before uh, the presentation started, I was talking with some folks here, uh, and oftentimes the discussion immediately goes to what's going on in DC. And that's important. The federal government is huge, it is way too big, uh, but I think what's important, especially for groups like this, for each and every person in this room as you went through who was running for which offices and the importance of these things, is to make sure that we're staying focused on the things that are closest to us, where we have the greatest ability to actually influence policy. And that's going to be our local government, it's going to be our county government, our local boards of education at the state level. What goes on in DC is largely going to happen whether we like it or not. Our ability to influence that is something approaching zero. But everybody in this room knows our state legislators. They're sitting here. You can buttonhole them on your way out, right? You have the ability to interact with them and to drive change at the state level. And we shouldn't lose sight of that, right? You could call it federalism. You could call it subsidiarity, whatever it is that you want to. The idea is is that problems should be solved as close to the people as possible. We shouldn't be looking to Topeka. We shouldn't be looking to Washington, D.C. to solve those problems. No matter if we happen to like the political party that's in charge at a given point, we should be focusing more and more of those decisions at the state level. And that is kind of my final admonition to you, and then we'll open it up to questions, is to make sure that we're driving these decisions down again to the local level. So instead of just saying it's this federal regulation and throwing our hands up or what have you, is making sure that we're encouraging our county governments, our city governments, our state governments to say, we're not going to let our state budget be dictated by the federal government. We're not going to necessarily expand Medicaid and let you attach all of these strings to it about how we do health care in the state. We're not going to let the feds determine how the school lunch program uh, dictates what we can teach or who gets to use which bathrooms in our public schools, right? Those decisions should be made by local boards of education, not somebody in Washington, D.C. So, and then finally, especially within like the context of, you know, often, you know, pretty heated uh, political debates and stuff like that, KPI is nonpartisan, we don't engage in electioneering and yada, 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 we don't do any of that kind of thing. So the attorney who's you know, always on my right shoulder can rest assured, right? Is it can be 
easier to talk about what it is that you're against rather than what you're for. But G.K. Chesterton has one of my favorite quotes, and he said um, years ago, I mean, he's now long since dead, that the true soldier fights for the love of what is behind him, not the hatred of what is in front of him. So I would encourage each of you to remember the love of what is behind you, your family, your community, yes, the Constitution, the ideals of liberty, and that is what everybody in this room I know agrees with, and that's what we should be fighting for. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I like questions anyway, so fire away. What's that? Thank you very much for uh, presenting to us today. Yeah. I have a question. I, I know you post articles about results of votes and things of that nature. It would be awesome, since you're the president, if y'all could add a link that goes straight to those bills and shows us how every person voted. It would be nice to hold our, our, uh, our legislators accountable for their votes against school choice as well as votes against lower taxes. Okay, um, it's uh, disappointing that you say that because we just redesigned our Kansas Freedom Index website. So, um, uh, yeah, point taken. Uh, but uh, we do try to make that available. We do have, uh, every year, um, we kind of capture a lot of different votes, um, not on everything or what have you, um, and try to get a sense of how the legislature actually votes. It's easy to say one thing when you're on the stump or something like that, but when it actually comes time, to vote yes or no, or occasionally present, or in some cases even show up, um, it's uh, for some legislators, it's, it's not enough to just get away with the platitude. It's about how they do actually vote. Um, so if you go to our website and look at the uh, Freedom Index, um, it does have that there, but uh, the fact that it's not more readily available is uh, troubling, so. Question about uh government involvement, something called public-private partnerships. We've got at the state level, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the new plan, Panasonic, uh, heavily subsidized by the state of Kansas, and competition with other states. And of course, locally here, we're a dollar an acre for riverfront land inside of the baseball stadium. Did you go into Kansas Policy Institute's uh, position, and, and where are you working on that, particularly at the state level? Yeah. So um, you'll forgive the complete shameless plug here, but we were the only group that testified against the Panasonic deal um, in the legislature when it passed uh, a couple of years ago. And on one hand, I have an awful lot of sympathy um, for government economic development officials and the legislature and things like that. Somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're going to give, or we're gonna create this many jobs in your state, and here's, you know, what it's going to cost, because every state engages in these kind of subsidies, let alone cities and counties and things like this. Um, so I'm, on some level, I'm very, very sympathetic. And I, you know, I've heard Mike Pompeo speak when he was uh, in Congress about, you know, it's really easy for politicians to be at a ribbon cutting, and they get to wear the hard hat, and they get the, you know, the golden spade, and they get their picture taken and their names on a plaque for a long, long time about this got built with this money or whatnot. Um, but the simple truth is that they just don't work uh, in any real meaningful way. We did a study with Art Hall, who is a professor at the University of Kansas. Uh, he's a good uh, free market professor, if such a thing exists in Lawrence. Um, uh, and he did a study with us where we looked at star bonds across the state. So this is some of the things that are used um, by local at the local level. And the first one was to build the racetrack up in Wyandotte County. And now they've been used all across the state in a variety of different ways. And his analysis shows that all it really does is shift existing jobs, existing economic growth within a given location. And they don't actually work. The, he, um, the one in the racetrack and the villages and all that nice stuff up in Johnson, or excuse me, up in Wyandotte County moved the needle a little bit, but even still it was not this dramatic expansion. It is what Friedrich Bastiat called the seen versus the unseen. It's easy to see the racetrack, the baseball stadium, an apartment complex, whatever it is from a TIF or a CID or a star bond or anything else. It's harder to see all of the things that don't happen because we're taking more money uh, from Walter here and we're gonna give it to Martin. And that is what we try to talk about, is understanding what happens with that dollar. It's easy to see what happens 
you know, with the ribbon cutting or whatnot, it's harder to see what could have happened if that dollar hadn't been spent in that way. And then it just gets awfully, awfully hard um, for most politicians uh, to say no to that kind of thing because you have a lot of very um, well-connected corporations and stuff who are the ones who are asking for these things. So despite the best efforts, a lot of folks, oftentimes they don't show a good ROI and they are just ripe for um, even some kind of soft corruption or something like that. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I've been in the call a little bit in terms of canvassing the local current cycle. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, Ed, you've got probably an excellent perspective. Is there an example here in the Midwest of uh, successful grassroots organization uh, of organizing against a involvement uh, uh, teachers union scenario? I mean, are, are there examples of uh, uh, what are the key salient features of, of that for like grassroots folks here that doesn't take place for success? Um, say that again. Repeat the question. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Can you restate the question? I'm, so at grassroots, how does a grassroots organization work against the... Uh, yeah, what would be a fan of Are there some keys to success for grassroots organizations. It's a David Wise scenario mm -hmm. of how we can be successful, how compete a, a more well-funded school board candidate. Okay, so uh, the question was about how do you uh, approach, especially in the educational setting, this kind of David and Goliath type approach to where you've got, you know, um, very localized benefits uh, with certain kinds of uh, organizations and individuals and the diffuse costs of parents and kids all across you know, a given jurisdiction. I will say again, you'll forgive me, um, KPI doesn't engage in elections, so I don't get to tell you how to vote for or against or organize for or against any Board of Education member. Um, but the principle still holds that it is oftentimes the unglamorous work of knocking on doors, and it is the slow and steady accumulation of um, a movement over time, right? It's, not, it's never going to be a thunderclap kind of a thing. It's amazing how much overnight success takes years and years and years worth of work, right? Um, in order to, to have that success. So, I, I, I'm struggling to, to come up with a, a good, succinct answer because KPI's been at this since 1996. We began in earnest in 2010 or 20, 2009, excuse me, and when we kind of relaunched uh, from the Flint Hill Center for Public Policy, and we haven't squared that circle yet, right? But every single time, we're getting a little bit further. You know, we passed an ESA. You know, we introduced an ESA for the first time four or five years ago. We passed an ESA for the first time in 2021. Um, through the House, um, it failed in the Senate there as well um, because somebody flipped their vote at the last minute for no seemingly good reason. Um, and then we passed it again this year. And we know that the governor's going to veto it when it gets to her desk. But it's every step of the way just keeping at it and not giving up. And it's easy, I even have to tell myself this, um, to look at the 10 states that have passed universal school of choice programs just in the last couple of years and say, why can't Kansas be like that too? But then I look back to where we were in 2014 when we passed our tax credit scholarship program that was for the lowest income kids in the worst performing public schools in the state. And now that program exists for kids who are earning up to 250% of federal poverty, so now you're well into the middle class, and it's any kid K through eight, it has nothing to do with where they actually attend. So we can look back at that and say, yes, I would love the big victory, but it is the day in, day out work that when the opportunity is right, you can take advantage of it um, is, is what it's going to take. As far as you know, specific examples, and I'm sorry for filibustering here, is um, you know, in a place like Arkansas, it was clearly different leadership that came in and made you know, educational choice a reality right now today. Something like in Iowa, it was a little bit more organic where you had grassroots organizations that were out there organizing at the precinct level, at the district level and things like that to actually push that thing 
uh, and get it to the governor's desk. James, thank yes. you. I always enjoy uh, listening to you speak. I'm, uh, my question is around after uh, an, ed an educational savings account is passed. Is there, is there a gap potentially in the knowledge of folks to be able to utilize that that you think is there? Um, and if so, what are ways that we can uh, prepare for that eventual, hopefully, eventual message? Right. So the question was about, you know, what happens, okay, you pass the ESA or any other bill for that matter, and what happens next, right? How do you get people more aware of it? Um, so we still have our tax credit scholarship program that exists that is not at max capacity. So in that regard, it's a lot of the schools, it's a lot of the nonprofits who are involved in that work who are out there actually hunting up the kids to try to get them enrolled, right? And that's how it's going to exist at the state level as well. Uh, in some of the ESA programs that have been passed in the last couple of months or years in, around the country, there are notification requirements uh, to where the local, uh, lots of acronyms, but essentially the local school district has to, excuse me, notify parents and families that this opportunity exists. But ultimately, the overwhelming majority of kids are always going to be educated in public schools. But on one hand, what we're trying to do with those ESAs is force some kind of a change on the system, knowing that most kids are going to go to East or West or College Hill Elementary or whatever. But it's giving folks the power of exit that is then going to force those public schools to also improve. So we want to give folks, again, that opportunity to find the right educational fit, knowing that that opportunity may exist right where they sit. And we've seen in Florida where they've had school choice in one form or another for something approximating, you know, a quarter of a century at this point, still only one or two percent of kids actually exercise a choice, but you've actually seen student achievement increase in the public schools as well. So it's not just benefiting the kids that leave, it's benefiting the kids who stay behind, so to speak, in the public school also. Yeah, I was wondering if you have an opinion the government's control of prices in the medical industry yeah. as to the reason why the rural hospitals are having to close and the medical performance is decreasing. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, I will caveat it initially by saying KPI doesn't have, we don't do a lot of healthcare work per se. So I do not know um, the ins and outs of Medicare pricing or uh, any of these kinds of things. Um, so I grew up in Johnson County, right, the most populous county in the state. I went to Kansas State University, but I married a young lady from Hodgman County. She had 20 kids in her graduating class. And this is going to get to your question in a roundabout way, so just give me a second. Um, even when we got married almost 20 years ago, um, they had a handful of guys who were working on the farm. And then during harvest, you know, maybe you even had 10 or 12, right? Now, as... Ag has been mechanized just like so much else. It just doesn't take as many people to operate that same kind of an operation, right? Um, they now do it with, you know, maybe three or four guys who are getting higher yields on the same land because instead of having a 20-foot header on your combine, you got a 35-foot header and you've got GPS auto steer and all this other kind of stuff. So part of me says as a state, we just haven't come to the realization that rural Kansas is just going to look very, very different than it has in the past. I'm not arguing for consolidation. I'm not arguing for forced closure of hospitals or anything like that. But I'm saying there are just fewer people who live in rural Kansas today than there were 20 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And we have a lot of built up infrastructure, hospitals in your question, um, that existed when there were more folks out there and there just aren't as many people in rural Kansas as there used to be. So it's gonna look a lot different. And there is no doubt in my mind that how Medicare and Medicaid set pricing for different things has all sorts of weird, quirky uh, implications for our hospitals, be it Wesley or a critical access hospital out on the Colorado border. James, thank you uh, yeah. very much for being here. We're truly grateful for the work that you do and the information that you provide us as legislators to help us make good and poor decisions. Uh, you, Dave, and, and the entire team are fantastic. Quick statement and then a question. Talk civil asset forfeiture for just a second here, because I know that's one of uh, your cruxes. So 
Uh, December 6th, that you're aware, uh, we will be having a special committee on civil asset forfeiture that I will be chairing, because this is a topic that I think we can work on as well. So uh, get your presentation ready, because you guys will be invited to share your thoughts during that time. My question is then, what part of the statute is the most concerning to you that if you had a magic wand, you would change? Okay. Um, I could ask you that same question. What would you change? Representative, no, but um, uh, no. Go ahead. I go for it. Well, one of my one of my biggest concerns in, in the civil asset forfeiture statute is is that we we compensate the money before conviction. Yeah. It really gives me a lot of heartburn. So often we see, and this is this is not. I, I'm very careful how I say this because reality is. Our law enforcement agency's ability to take the ill-gotten gains off the street from the illegal drug trade is very important. It is critical. And the things that it funds are remarkable. However, what we've seen, and I think what the data is going to show us on December 6th, is that there are a number of departments that are focusing on those low-level dollar amounts, two, three, four hundred dollars that there really isn't a true due process involved there. Um, and then, of course, if they don't have anybody to charge, nobody comes and challenges it, and it's a very convoluted process. So that would be my concern. I'd like to hear yours. No, I would agree with that. Um, it, so uh, we do most of that work with uh, our Kansas Justice Institute. Sam McRoberts is our litigator. Um, he's actually at a, at a judicial council meeting uh, today talking about this very topic up in Topeka. Um, I mean, on one hand, it is the... We're innocent until proven guilty, and that same thing should exist when it comes to property as well. Um, so it's easy to say, if you're not convicted, you shouldn't actually have your property seized. Uh, and it's not Miami Vice type of seizures, to your second point. So if there were one thing that I could do today, it would be setting a minimum threshold. And I don't know if uh, on what is able to be seized. You know, when we had the, uh, the hearing uh, before the House Judiciary Committee this year, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, what happens if there's, you know, a private jet parked on a uh, runway somewhere when the back end's full of cocaine or something, and it's a million-dollar seizure. Uh, I have enough trust in our law enforcement to suggest that they'll be able to get to the bottom of that. I have enough uh, uh, faith in our prosecutors that they will be able to get that sorted. But what about the guy who's driving to pay his rent, and he's got 600 bucks in cash sitting on the seat next to him in his car and he gets pulled over and uh, never actually gets charged with maybe possession of marijuana or something like that. Um, even though, you know, there were some residue or a dog marked on his car or something like that. And then that $600 just goes. So I don't know if that, I don't know what that threshold is at, but that seems like there's an opportunity there between the people who are pushing for reform and the law enforcement community to really be able to say, okay, it's $500, it's $1,000, I don't know what it is, right? But there's got to be something to where we say, okay, you can't seize anything less than that um, without a, you know, a, a conviction. Um, so if there were one thing, it would be setting some kind of a floor. Can you give us a little bit more information on the, uh, the how somebody goes and gets or applies for the credit, the 250% yep. of a poverty level? I, recently somebody asked me about that. I gave them information that I had received, and then they just contacted me again and said, I can't go anywhere with this. I'm not getting anywhere. So somebody's poverty level, they want to take their kid to a private school. Right. How, who do they go to apply to to get money to do that? So uh, I'll give you my card. I've got them, you know, and then I can talk to that specific person and how, happy to help walk them through. Um, but this is not a tax credit that it comes to us as individuals on behalf of our own children, right? So the way this program works is um, donors get a 75% credit on their state income taxes if they make a contribution for scholarships to a scholarship granting organization, which is just a mouthful of words to talk about a recognized nonprofit in the state. There's about 10 of them around the state. And each of those scholarship granting organizations work with a different collection of private schools. 
you know, there's one for the Catholic schools here in the diocese. There's one up in Kansas City, each of the four Catholic dioceses. There's secular ones, there's faith-based ones, all sorts of different stuff. And then those scholarship granting organizations give scholarships up to $8,000 per kid for a, a child to attend a private school of their choice. As a purely practical matter, if little Johnny isn't happy in his public school, um, Jennifer's looking at people nasty because their phones are ringing, right? Um, is that they contact the school that they would like to attend. And almost, I have never encountered a private school that doesn't offer scholarshiping of one sort or another anyway. So if that little kid contacts the private school that they want to attend and say, hey, I would like to come here, I can't afford it, they're going to have a scholarship office that can walk them through that. And they're probably also going to have uh, a scholarship officer of one sort or another who knows the ins and outs of that program and they're going to be able to say okay we've got money eligible for kids to attend this school at a scholarships or the SGO that works with Urban Preparatory Academy or the Support Catholic Schools Office or Renew a Nation or any of the other SGOs in the state but I'll give you my card and we can chat as well. Hey James good to see you sir. So it's been a pleasure to work with you since I was on the state board. I've been education back in 2008 and 12. These issues are still remain the same. Only one in three kids is actually proficient in the state of Kansas. That's according to NAEP and the ACT scores as well for kids going to college. Now, my concern and question to you has to do with the fact that we have a cap of $10 million dollars in the legislature on the tax credit scholarships. Right. We've never gotten more than about $4 million to contribute. We have statewide spending about $6 billion on public education. The problem I find is that even though we've been trying to get people to think about choice, what is your evidence that there's actually any improvement in test scores for those kids that do go to a private school or to a charter school? For example, my good friend, Wade Moore, as you know, has been trying to get his accreditation approved by the State Department of Ed, but he hasn't provided data on student achievement for the last three years. Do you have any data that shows that the kids that are going to these private schools or uh, charter schools are actually doing any better than the ones in our regular schools? The second thing I want to bring up is that in Florida, they had an improvement in scores, but they said a standard said by third grade you read or you don't go on. Right. We have been doing social promotion in this state forever. So until we get some way to have the kids actually perform before we give them a chance to go up to the next grade or get a diploma, can't we put our focus on that instead of saying, well, maybe if you go to a different school you actually learn more, when in fact it's up to the kids to open the book and take the test. Right. So, uh the data that exists for why school of choice matters um, is that the parent made a decision to choose a different school. And we should be trusting those parents to know what is in the best interest of those kids, whether it, um, whether it appears on a standardized test or not. And because people educate their kids for lots of different reasons. They choose their educational environment for their children for lots of different reasons. It could be safety, it could be faith, or some other kind of you know morality or ethical issue. It could be because we really want my kid to be in a, you know, a, a fine arts uh, magnet school or something, or math or science or what have you. So the data is, is that families are exercising this choice and up until this point they haven't had it. They've only been able to attend the school where their zip code tells them to do, or they hope and pray that they're wealthy enough to find something different. More fundamentally to your question, and then this gets into the second part of your question about um, achievement, is we've been talking about this since even long before you were on the State Board of Education in one way or another, right? There was school choice discussions um, in the 90s in the state legislature, the first uh, voucher program in the country, well not the first, excuse me, I correct myself, modern school choice program uh, was in Milwaukee in the 1980s. Uh, we've had town tuitioning programs in Vermont and Maine. 
um, that have existed from uh, the 1850s. Um, so there's nothing new under the sun. We're going to be talking about this now. We're going to be talking about it 50 years from now because it's half the state budget. It's the most fundamental thing. Uh, but I would point to the fact that Florida's scores on the NAEP exam have increased considerably over those last uh, 25 years. In 2003, I believe it was, we Kansas students beat Florida students on six out of the eight NAEP categories, and now it is exactly the opposite. They beat us on six out of those eight NAEP categories. NAEP is the National Assessment for Educational Progress. It's the easiest way to compare kids across states. To the second part of your question, because they didn't just do one thing. They did school choice. They did A through F grading to where you understood exactly how your kid's school was performing. Um, and then they also did this social promotion thing. Social promotion is the idea that you just move through school with your age cohort, right? And they said, if you can't read after third grade, you're not going to fourth grade. And that seems harsh. There was a proposal, there have been multiple proposals, but it really got legs in 2014, but it ultimately failed in the legislature. Um, but I think the interesting thing is people are saying, oh, this is too cruel, you're holding a kid back, there's a stigma. There's also a stigma about not being able to read. And if you can't read when you leave third grade, that kid is going to have an incredibly blinkered future because they can't. So I'm very, very sympathetic to that. But what you saw in Florida was what they started to do was identify these kids in kindergarten and first grade or even in pre-K programs and giving them interventions. It wasn't just, hey, you, don't, you can't read, you don't get to go on. It was, we know Walt is struggling as a first grader, you know, connecting sight to sound or science of reading or whatever you. We're not gonna wait until he gets to third grade and then just pull the plug on him. We're gonna give him the interventions that he needs now in order to be ready for third grade as well. Yeah. Mr. Franco, thank you very much for coming through today. I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you're saying. I've been there in the fight with you, and many of my colleagues here as well. One of the things that me and my wife, we do, we don't send our kids out to public school for a reason. We don't want to send them out to Caesar every day to be surprised. And night the program comes home, we have a D program and a free program. So there's that. Uh, the other thing is that we don't want to, from the legislative uh, side of the house, we used to be able to pay for 12 education unless you're exactly right. Uh, 51 cents of every tax dollar is tax goes to K-12 uh, education. And here in the USD 259, which is our abysmal, just like USD 500, abysmal schools. We are basically graduating these kids and, you know, trumping up about from the Department of Education how high the graduation rate is, 80 plus percent of the graduation rate. And that's all going on, slapping a bumper sticker on their behind, but they can't read the bumper sticker to your point. My question is hard to so thank you. Oh, and by the way, uh, as vice chair of the Central County GOP, I fully support anybody that's a candidate for a school board or for any of our legislatures uh, that agrees with what you're saying. So just let me have my question. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say is this, uh, or ask the question. When it comes to regulatory reform, is there anything that KPI does that you would, uh, because I see that right now the cost of government is getting more exorbitant, and that the people have too much on their backs for taxation and everything. There's things that we, there are things that we can do right now in the legislature coming up in the next session. Does KPI really have any uh, thought about that? Where can you direct us for that? And what would be the recommendations to do uh, regulatory reform? So the short answer is yes, regulatory reform is good. Uh, <laughs> um, most of our work has been on occupational licensure um, reform so that, you, again, you don't have to get the permission slip for more and more uh, professions to be able to, to earn your living. Um, I know there are some discussions, there was the constitutional amendment that failed, was it last fall, um, that would have put the legislature back in charge of regs coming from the executive branch. Um, two things, one, there is um, gonna be an effort to push for any kind of major regulatory reform, uh, the dollar amount, you know, to do a cost benefit analysis and anything over a certain amount. Um, as far as the cost of a new reg will have to be approved by the legislature and based, I am not an attorney, uh, thank heavens, but there's a lot of folks who think that that can be done in a constitutional way. Um, so I think we will be pushing for that. So it is essentially a uh, legislative approval of regs over a certain uh, dollar amount. Um, and then the less sexy answer to that is instead of simply saying with any statute, um, the secretary may or the secretary shall is that when the legislature passes a new law, they should be the one saying, this is how we want this thing to work. 
not just turning over the authority to the administrative agency, but actually saying, this is what we want, and we're going to write specifically into the statute, this is what these terms mean, and you are, you as the, you know, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment or whatever are charged with ensuring that these <laughs> things are met rather than just saying, hey, we want clean air. KDHE, go out and make sure that, you know, uh, some private entity gives us clean air, but is being more specific in each and every piece of legislation. And then even if there's a piece of legislation that comes up uh, that isn't necessarily related, you know, it's a, maybe it's a, a fines and fees thing that we have to modernize every couple of years or what have you, is if you're going to get into that statute as a legislator, is maybe see, okay, while we're in here with that statute, what else can we do to tighten up definitions to make sure that there is clarity of legislative intent? Because what was said in a committee hearing when the bill was passed five years ago or 50 years ago has very little meaning on what happens in the actual regulatory process itself. Thank you. Thank you to James Franklin.